Good day, everybody. It is the afternoon of July 21, 2020. And silver, as we speak, is up uh, roughly a dollar thirty-eight, something like that. It's about, I guess, seven percent. I haven't calculated it. I'm just giving it a guess. And gold is the piddling up about twenty-five bucks. And uh, one of the great gurus of the gold and silver world, very respected. My friend Chris Marcus with, is with us. And Chris, in addition to being a debonair, handsome gentleman, is also the author of a book on the, the uh, subterfuge of shorting silver by the big banks. And his book is called The Big Silver Short by Chris Marcus. Chris has done tremendous amount of work on this subject. He knows more about it than I do, and I kind of read more than most people, I would say. But uh, on this subject, he knows more than I do. Uh, but let's start off by giving uh, the audience a little bit of background on you, how you first got into the financial world, first of all, as a mainstream guy, in other words, part of a criminal cabal, um, and then kind of began to see the reality of what you were involved in and how you then transmogrified into the Chris Marcus that you are now. So well, tell us. I appreciate you having me here on your show today, Handsome Bob. Um, it's been nice learning a lot about radio from you, especially in the past year. And in terms of the silver thing, it was never, uh, I, don't, I don't know that one plans for a career in the silver market. Uh, I mean, I'd gone to finance undergrad. My first job out of school was with Moody's, the bond rating agency that still has US debt, AAA rated. Then I was so bored there. It never made sense because we were rating these asset-backed commercial paper programs, which were essentially the type of thing Enron was doing. Um, in fact, Enron blew up within a couple months of being there. I, at the time, thought I had escaped to Wharton's Business School, um, where I learned Keynesian economics from Jeremy Siegel and was prepped for the banking system. Fortunately, I did not end up Joining a bank, aside from an internship at Merrill Lynch, uh, ended up trading equity options for Susquehanna, which was kind of like the, we were like the smart dorky kids. I didn't like really know how to talk to people all that easily, but we're good with math and, you know, if you can be trained a certain way. So I felt the option training was really helpful because, you know, it's in life, there's what maybe we think should happen or what we think is fair. And there's what does happen, whether we like that outcome or not, and reconciling the two. Um, I felt I was trained really well with that. So when the housing bubble collapsed in uh, 2007 and 2008, I found it odd how all of our you know, economic geniuses like Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner and Lord Paulson, you know, none of them are all talking about how was the perfect storm yet the guy who actually trained me as an option trader, who was a really, someone I knew well, was really intelligent, really in, uh, respected. And he sent me a couple Peter Schiff videos. In fact, I remember that day on the trading floor, it was March, uh, early March of 2009, the day the uh, market went down to 666 level. Um, but that was when Bernanke launched what was, I guess, QE1 or part the second part of QE1. And I remember this guy who had trained me, him and uh, another fellow were talking about how soon we were going to be paying $11 for a loaf of bread. But it was, you know, maybe a small thing. But to me, it was always the turning point because I remember thinking, all right, this sounds different than what I've always heard. It's different than what I've been trained with yet. Here's someone I respect. I was like, well, should I just like discount it or at least 
why is he saying this? Um, that was when I was introduced to Austrian economics, which led me to gold. I find if you and like that was through P that was through Peter Schiff. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm interviewing Peter Schiff tomorrow. So I'll uh, let him know you gave him some credit uh, because he also uh, was the precipitant of an epiphany for me in the same regard. In fact, Peter talks about the fact that of all the things Americans are ignorant of, which is a very long list, uh, economics is probably numero uno. And uh, a guy like you, who's bright and went to top schools, you, of course, learned about John Maynard Keynes. You learned about Paul Samuelson. You learned about Benjamin Bernanke. But you didn't learn very much about Ludwig von Mises, Hans Senholz, Friedrich von Hayek, Murray um, uh, Rothbard. Rothbard, I'm losing my mind here. Murray Rothbard. And, You're too smart for your own good, handsome. That's Ross. right. You can't keep it all in one place. And, and Henry Hazlitt, the author of a great book called Economics in One Lesson. All those people were kind of hidden from view. And the reason for that is uh, the honest economists are not financed by the Federal Reserve. And most economics departments are. And so here you are getting all of that BS in school. Some of it has a value, if not just learning everything that isn't true, that has a value also. But it also says something about your character that unlike most people who are robotic drones, you actually began to question things. And the reason you question things is because you have character. And when you have character, you care about what is true and what is not true. Uh, unfortunately, that is rare today. And for that, I gave you great credit. So let's take it from your working in the Wall Street establishment. What was the first signs to you, other than the crashing of the housing market, that something was missing in terms of your um, your plethora of knowledge, which was incomplete. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of like in the Big Short that scene where they go down to Miami, they talk to the guys that and you know the, sees the stripper that's levered up on five houses, and it was like that's when it really sunk in. Um, certainly, hearing that eleven dollar loaf of bread, but. It took a while to accept it because it's almost like hard to believe that things could be this distorted and wacky and so many unusual things uh, the way it's set up. Yet, I remember when my boss at Susquehanna, the trading shop, I was seeing all these things with the debt and I went and talked to him about it one day and said, this you know, doesn't look like this is headed in the right direction. And he just looked at me and gave me one of those like, well, you know, that only happens in those mud countries. I mean, this is the United States where, and that was when I was thinking, all right, there's something, you know, maybe this is really, because it's not like an economic puzzle, but it's more, I've thought of it for a couple of years as the greatest hypnotic thought experiment in history it's like the, the Fed, they, they're telling you right in your face that they're manipulating the bond market. They just call it policy, and, you know, like hope everybody plays along and you get, you know, the Democrats to sew the costumes, the Republicans to argue against the Democrats and all this nonsense that has nothing to do with anything where I, my personal belief, and certainly uh, I know you're familiar with G. Edward Griffin, the author of Preacher from Jekyll Island, talks about whether it's the same bank funding both sides of the war or both sides you know you get people angry against each other and you know things go off off kilter and i mean they, they both start a lot of wars spend money lodge us into debt i don't i don't believe it's designed to be the ideal we were sold at here's uncle george and uh bubba bill and they're 
I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, sit here and pick on politicians today, but to the degree you can see what's happening financially. And, you know, I had this introduction into metals and I had an option trading background. So when I got that note in my trader notes, October of 2010, I believe, maybe September, probably September, that Ben Bernanke was going to launch QE2. By then I was ready. And I remember because I purchased that was when I bought my thousand ounce block of silver, which weighs approximately a million tons. If you try and carry that home on the path train, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but I started buying call options on GLD and SLV. And in fact, part of my decision to leave Wall Street, well, on one hand, I just found this was really interesting and a lot more fun than what I was doing. Um, also, I thought I was kind of home free financially because I continue to wonder if in 2011, we weren't close to seeing the dollar go off the rails back then, but were it not for selling a lot of paper contracts to hammer both gold and silver from their highs, maybe what we're seeing happen now was close to happening back then. Um, and perhaps the ability to sell paper, gold and silver that doesn't exist. Um, you know, that was one of the things in the book that I just released, we covered where I asked, you know, David Morgan, Andrew McGuire, Ted Butler, a bunch of other guys, for every piece of silver out there, how many people think they own it via one derivative or paper claim? And Handsome Bob, would you like to take a guess at that one? I have no idea. I didn't get an answer. I've not yet gotten an answer of less than 500. So it's set up for the ending of It's a Wonderful Life. And I mean, it's like, you know, I know sometimes- Ex Explain that to the audience, the ending of It's a Wonderful Life and how you relate- That's the flaw of fractional reserve banking that all the Austrian scholars that you cited speak of, that anyone who's looked at this through history and is familiar that there's not a single fiat paper currency that has ever survived zero where you start creating stuff out of thin air if it sounds too good to be tr that's what i love about economics if it sounds like all right so these banks like built a lot of condos that were completely uneconomic and then uncle ben's gonna come along you know spin his like little dickery do and we're all prosperous again i mean of course that sounds silly and it's a broad day bank robbery just in uh, in disguise. So, you know, if you sell the same asset, you know, whether it's printing money, if you're rehypothecating something out of thin air, because we don't, we think we want money, but it's really the stuff that money can buy. You want a house, and there's. That, when you that's say rehypothecating, you mean that a bank is supposed to be holding something, for example. And then they go and sell it five or six or 10 or 20 times the same exact thing. No, five, five or 600 times or a thousand right. or 2000 yeah. times. Right. Like Bernie Madoff. Exactly. Not like Bernie, exactly what. Yeah. He fact, should be secretary of the treasury. At least he knows how to do a Ponzi scheme the right way. <laughs> I mean, I think a big part of it is also presenting it as legitimate. Um, I'm comfortable saying that I, I don't know. I mean, it just like how I think of it internally to help the world make sense to me. It's like what we see in Goodfellas or the Godfather imagine. And I mean, do we really know for sure that Trump's boss and Putin's boss and Xi Jinping's boss, I'm not saying definitely, but could they be reporting to the same person? I mean, there's so much of what we've been told of reality, you know, just this whole Wall Street. I know that probably sounds like a, maybe an outrageous statement to some people here and that, but I mean, is that different than the way people are like worshiping the guys that lied about weapons of mass destruction and went and blew stuff up? And in the same way, there's plenty of evidence of insider front running prior to September 11th. I mean, geez, talk about the last couple months. I mean, you know,
you know, uh, the whole Corona thing aside, I mean, what I don't think there's any question about, I mean, this was a broad day bank robbery where trillions of dollars are going missing. I mean, we're, how far are we from Ben Bernanke's helicopter money? <laughs> I mean, we have Donald Trump sending out checks. I mean, maybe we actually need to like, maybe it'd be like and one of those. Said, he said he's against socialism. He is socialism, and so are the Democrats. They're all the same. Doesn't matter if it's Obama or your mama, <laughs> or Trump, bump, or hump. Handsome Bob, can you hire Ben Bernanke for my birthday party to like <laughs> actually like rent the helicopter? I mean, it's almost. But what I think is interesting is that you know it's fine for you and me to joke about it, but when you get like stuff like that on Saturday Night Live where they're doing skits about it. That's what I think is quite different, more so than in 2016, even more so than in 2011, where it's like, there's mainstream people coming in. Uh, now we're seeing, see often it's, at least historically has been, the money flows to gold first, then silver and gold stocks. And then when it's like, once it starts flowing into silver stocks, usually that's the last, and that's been happening now. And also the money flowing into the junior minus mining that stuff too. Mm -hmm. that comes later on. But let's go back a little bit. You, you get out of the Wall Street establishment and you make a transition into the world of real money. And uh, as JP Morgan said, I believe in 1905, Gold is simply money. Nothing else is money, just gold. And of course, according to the US Constitution, silver is also money because the Constitution says that no state shall make anything. Cons gold. Cons to what? 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 I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. What, what, you, what are you saying? A constitution. Oh, I read about that. Oh, Constitution. <laughs> Yeah, Just think that at least uh, a piece of paper, you know, the George Bush said, get that piece of paper out of my face. Remember that? It's uh, distracting. I'm trying to sign this. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, the American people know about as much about the Constitution as they do about gold and silver. And that's the amazing thing that gold has gone up six times just in this century with what percent of people being invested in gold in terms of the population? Is it 1% or 2%? Do you know the number? Well, I believe uh, it's actually recently because it's been quite low these last couple of years. I think it was like about a half of a percent, although I believe maybe the average was like 1% to 2%. So it's like even to get back to the average, but that's the thing is like, and especially why silver, silver, the market is so small. You, I mean, you, it's not like rocket science. You put enough leverage on anything and you'll get, you'll guarantee a big move, right? You stuff a beach ball underwater, like Peter Schiff has said, by the way, please tell him I said hello tomorrow. Okay, um, we've, well. we've talked before, so you can tell him, uh, and I've, let him know how influential he was in my career. And he had that great analogy where it's like, you stuff the beach ball underwater. I mean, some of this is direct cause and effect. Now, maybe it takes longer than uh, an investment community that likes results next day, next quarter would like. I mean, you know, the silver distribution, I can, attempt to guess what it is and maybe it is what I want it to be or not but I mean it's going to do what it's going to do and it's up to me to use the clues as intelligently as possible to say all right how can we take this because I think people are massively mispricing it um, and the best part is you don't have to be some hedge fund wizard to really take advantage of it in fact Again, when I was trading equity options, that it's a bit short term by nature. Yet, even despite that, I found silver. I mean, we're accepting we're part of the the reason there's an opportunity there is because it is the most manipulated asset possibly in history. So, 
you know, but that doesn't mean it's going to go up on the, the schedule that we might think that it should or want it to. But, you know, for people... Tell, tell the viewers why the powers that be would want to manipulate the precious metals. Well, I think there's two layers to it where you have the banks and then the government. So I think the average banker is focused on his next bonus. You know, it's like, I don't think they would care about race, about the weather. I mean, maybe I'm generalizing here, but I mean, it's that type of mindset, you know, and people say, well, can't they manipulate it up and down? Absolutely. And that's exactly what's been happening. In fact, until last year, I wish I hadn't been so slow to clue in on it, but you had this commitment of traders reports. You could see how long or short the banks were in it. Like clockwork, if you just, you know, it's maybe not to the letter, but maybe success in trading is getting 80 or 90% or even 40 or 50% of a rally. But so I think the banks are happy because they've made a fortune. Bob, as you well know, as a uh, legal expert, and an investor, I mean, if I told you 100% confidence that the price of any stock is going to move even like 20 cents at a specific time, you can essentially through derivatives, you know, make a fortune from that, right? So the greed factor is one part of it. But what about the agenda factor? Well, so you, on the other hand, you have the government that likes to cheat and make money too. Although, at least as best as I've been able to piece it together over the past decade, you know, if historically gold and silver prices are the, it's like the thermometer telling you what, hey, it's too hot, maybe we should <laughs> turn it down, you know, it feels like it's 120 degrees in here and, you know, you're putting logs on the thing, we're all sweating, because, but, you know, you're building a fire because it says 20 degrees, well, maybe it's it's broken and maybe it's being rigged. So, you know, oh, well, uh, I don't know, gold's $1,300 for the last couple of years. Why would anybody want that thing? Well, you know, when gold's now about to set a new all time high, people notice that. And that's the thing. It's like, you can lie to people for long enough and sometimes it can go on decades or maybe even hundreds of years, but that's what I think is playing out now. I mean, it's getting, that's why you have new people. It's not just the gold and silver bugs. You have new money coming in because like, what are they supposed to say? You pimp Jay Powell out there and he says, <clears throat> goes on 60 minutes, flat out lies. He said, this is different than 2008 because the economy was strong before COVID. Then why was he doing repo lines since last September? And if it's so strong and this isn't the time to repay it, why didn't we repay it the last 10 years when the economy was supposedly roaring yet we were tacking on debt? Yeah, the economy was so strong that they're suppressing interest rates at the zero bound because it's very strong. People cannot afford to make payments. That's why they're keeping it that way. And of course, in 2018, when they attempted to elevate the interest rates, the entire market began to crash even a lousy couple of a fraction of a percentage points was too much for the market. <clears throat> so we understand that gold is the canary in the coal mine. It signals that there's a lot of poison gas in the economy. And the reason why gold has gone up six times in this century is because we're in very serious economic trouble. And I know that you had on your program, you interviewed Bart Chilton, who was, I believe, a former Goldman Sachs guy, who was the chairman of the CFTC, the Com Commodities Futures Trading um, Agency. And tell us about that interview and what that proved. This was right before, uh, or at least shortly before Bob Chilton passed away. Yeah, it was certainly a pretty big stunner. Uh, I guess in some ways certainly changed my life. Uh, I mean, he was actually part of that book that I just released. The big really what, big Silver Short. The Big yeah. Silver Short. Big yeah. Silver Short. 
And really the, I mean, partly how this came about, like I, I for a decade have been studying this, I've never seen anything trade like it. It never makes sense. If you try and match like the supply and demand or the events that are happening, it just, and that's why when I heard Bart years ago, I emailed him in 2011 uh, and the other commissioners, uh, a couple, whoever was my local congressman back then saying, hey, I'm working on a trading floor, I study gold and silver and, you know, something <laughs> not right here. He was the only one who wrote back and it was interesting. He said, you can reference some of the recent interviews I've done or comments I've made, which I, I knew about. And, and in those, he talks about how he thought the market was manipulated. He talks about Andrew McGuire giving him evidence and then it would play out. Andrew McGuire, who's a whistleblower in this case, you can still look at the transcripts online where he's walked uh cftc uh guy through it this was back in 2009 bart came on my show i because i remember like of the people i was thinking to ask bart's name popped up and i'd be like wow that'd be really interesting to hear what he had to say and then you know it's like i almost talked myself out of it with uh, well he's never going to come on here he won't say anything and Really nice guy, really supportive. Uh, I, I know some people think he, you know, is part of the establishment or I think he also helps to factor in people's perspective. I mean, he was a government employee for most of his life. I didn't know that he worked for Goldman. Uh, I'm not uh, sure. I, I, I had thought so. I could be wrong. I'm not sure if he did. I know he had a long career in government. So, and I mean, it's like, I don't think... <clears throat> I'm guessing that even during the time he was doing the investigation, he didn't grasp what so many of us are seeing now of like how wild this thing really is, especially given that it seems like we're seeing a run on the metal now, but it felt the honest per, uh, impression I got was he appreciated what I was doing. He was he appreciated that someone was following up. I think he did what he felt he could. And in that interview, he flat out, that's why it was so uh, important for everyone in the silver world because he confirmed what so many analysts, certainly Ted Butler, uh, Chris Powell, and Bill Murphy of GATA who have been doing this long before Gata, I was. By GATA, you mean the Gold Antitrust Action Committee that actually was on to this subject before you were. Oh, a long time before. I mean, I don't uh, know if I ever would have found it if it weren't for those guys and Ted um but i mean it's like when you go and actually listen and you know but it's like uh, it's, it's like if you say anything other than the stock market is great you know people look at you like you're a fruit loop so it requires a little bit willing to stand up against the crowd although i guess that's the thing to and, and what's fun about investing is that well, really, the best trade is like if everybody thinks you're wrong, but you know they're wrong, that's when you're getting great odds. And that's the thing. So, you know, I know some people get frustrated if your buddies mock you because you're into gold or silver. But I would say, you know, every time like, I mean, I know maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm not. Well, I think we're going to find out soon enough. But anytime uh, someone's like thinks gold or silver is silly or anything like that. Um, that means there's more money on the other side of the trade. So by nature, you're getting better odds. And that's part of why, you know, that everybody does see such a conditioned world. Um, so, so many fascinating. Summar summarize for us the smoking gun that Bob Chilton testified to uh, on your show. Say that again, Bob. What was the smoking gun? that Bart Chilton affirmed on your show? Well, it was actually connecting that with what Andy Schechtman of uh, Precious Metals dealer, Miles Franklin, he also did an interview for the book. And it was interesting because as I would uh, read back and review what Bart was saying, he talks about how JP Morgan took over Bear Stearns' silver position when they failed. A lot of people have talked about that. Um, Bart confirmed it. He had direct access. The CFTC approved the deal. So it's one thing for me to speculate, but Bart had access to it. So he confirmed that. What 
I don't know if as many people caught that he said after that was how JP Morgan, the position was over the limit. They were given a waiver to make it smaller. Instead, he's like, he didn't remember if it was three, six or nine months, but in either case, they came back a couple months later and they had made it bigger in direct. And he was pissed because he's like, this is direct. You're already too big over the limit. You made it bigger. And this, Keep in mind, this isn't some random time period, though. Because for people who remember 2008, silver, because you had 2007, this started year before, half before Lehman. So you had mortgages failing. Uh, you had big issues in the credit market. I was trading. That was my first year trading options. So it'd be, it was wild. Um, nobody knew what the heck was going on. And you had the Fed cutting interest rates at a historic clip. So silver is rallying from 13 to 21 up to when Bear Stearns fails. Then within days, you have Bear Stearns fail, which Bart says, you know, J.B. Morgan just took over the position. Ed does another 75 basis point cut that week, more money printing. I believe that was their largest money printing interest rate cut bomb in history at that time. So the conditions where you'd think like people would be clamoring for not just what CNBC says, but why people actually buy gold and silver and all of a sudden silver just gets torched within days. It's dropping from 21, you know, you have the summer, uh, there's more trouble than Lehman fails. Silver is just plunging during this. But what's interesting is that Again, Bart Shilton's confirming JP Morgan's making their position bigger at this exact time. And the smoking gun to me is that you had Miles Franklin almost go out of business because they could not find product to sell in a market where supply is supposedly overwhelming demand, dropping the price over 50%. Um, and nowhere, not in Europe, not in the US, the mints were down. So, Bart, you know, it's Bart, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take Gata's word for it. You don't have to take Ted's word for it. You don't, it. Bart confirmed it. And I know some people, you know, don't like hearing manipulation or that markets are distorted. That's fine. I'm just the guy who worked on a trading floor and then investigated. In fact, the book was almost an attempt to disprove or find what I was missing. Because to me, if the main reason silver came down in price from 2011 was because a bunch of banks that now the Department of Justice have labeled as a criminal enterprise were manipulating the market, selling gold and silver they don't have, that was why I've really dedicated my career around one form or another capturing, all right, well, this has to go. I see that as the floor. You could tell me it's going to happen tomorrow, or maybe it's dragged out a couple more years, but in the same way that nobody wanted to hear Peter Schiff talk about the housing bubble in 2005 or 2006. You know, there's, there's some things that if you're looking, they're there. And I created that book to at least make it easier for people to put it all in perspective. People who want to watch the Bart Schultz interview can uh, see it on behind you. It says Arcadia Economics. So they can just go on that site and watch your video interview with uh, Bart Shilton. Explain to the viewers the basic fundamental mechanics of how the government and the big banks are able to sometimes suppress the price of gold and silver. And talk as if you're talking to an elementary school class. What about, Handsome Bob, if I make it easy enough that even a congressman could understand it? <laughs> <laughs> you like that one? Yeah, or, or, or a president. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if, uh, let's not you know, offend the audience. <laughs> um, of, the, of either party, I might ask, I might add, rather. So absolutely, give us either and all the of them. Um, I'm going to see if I can get this chart pulled up here. Um, but basically, that was another thing that fortunately Bart confirmed because, you know, part of why it's so tricky, there's not, 
it's not the easiest stuff to track down. You know, it, they don't, they're not helping you find these things. Um, but the basic version I had heard and as I studied came to believe sounded most plausible and which Bart confirmed is that like essentially at the big round numbers, like when it's near $20, which we'd call the handle. So a lot of people put stop orders in there, you know, it's just how people are, I guess. And so, I mean, you know, so let's say you own a silver facsimile and you want to sell it. So you make sure you keep your $20, they'll place a stop order in there. So there's a lot of trading activity that happens around these big round numbers. Then you have high frequency trading algorithms that, you know, accelerate things. So what I asked Bart was that, you know, what I've heard and come to understand was that let's say silver is at $20 and five cents. You kind of nudge it a little, you could push it. Then once you get, you know, $20, 1999, 1998, it's like you're taking advantage of like the artificial intelligence algorithms, they kick in. So, you know, it's going to plunge. And what Ted Butler reports is that I guess he tracks JP Morgan and every time, you know, you've seen like the, the same banks selling and then buying it back cheaper. And it's funny because when I asked this to Bart, you know, he talks about it for a minute and he's like, so what you'd say, what, what you said I'd say is a really good description, except that now because of the way the markets are set up, when it happens, the spoofs is the term that they call it. He said, basically, when they cheat, now they can get the market to movement bigger because everything is more levered up. You have more fast money. You have more Fed dollars. And when you say spoof, it's a spoof is like a head fake in sports. A spoof Nothing. is what the Department of Justice has been getting them to plead guilty to, which I guess is like if you send out an offer or a bid and you get someone to think there's something there and then you pull it and you know, you can kind of game the way people are going to react to that. I don't know if that's really false impression that that the metals are being sold when in fact no trade is actually executed. Is that correct? I mean, approximately that's that's the gist of it. Um, I don't think that's really at the heart or the essence of the bigger crime here. Um, what is maybe... the essence? What's that? What is at the essence of the bigger crime? Well, whether you call it a crime or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just the way markets work. But if you have people selling silver and gold that they can never deliver, then whatever you call that, I mean, that's to me what's worth being aware of and why I continue to believe that we'll see some stunning moves in both gold and silver. You know, it's like since... I mean, you remember back in, you know, it used to be guns or butter and then LBJ comes along. It's like, let's, it's a, we go buffet style. Let's eat it all. So it's not an accident that the London gold pool, a very similar scheme where, you know, when the U S was on the dollar, but everyone sees them, you know, just going to Vietnam and spending money wildly. So there was a drain on the gold. It wasn't, a random coincidence that Nixon took us off in 1971. But by 1974, we had uh, futures contracts. So it was like from one scheme to another. And this one's unraveling in the same way. In fact, Bob, if I could leave your audience with, uh, you know, I know I talked about a lot of different things here. And if you're hearing it for the first time can, you know, be a little bit to take in, but watch the the delivery demands that we're seeing now in SLV and the other silver trusts and also on the COMEX where we're seeing record requests for metal. People are finally showing up saying, I want my metal. Explain what the COMEX is. Say again, please. Explain what the COMEX is. The COMEX, the commodities exchange where gold and silver are traded, um, a big chunk of this selling paper, gold and silver, that doesn't exist scheme. Um, and that's why my view hasn't really changed too much in the past decade where, you know, the prices will stay low as long as they stay low. Maybe it'll be tomorrow. Maybe it will drag out a couple more years. 
I think we're pretty close to the end of this scheme, but you know, I price in things can go longer. They can be distorted, but I mean, if those basic uh, data points, a lot of which Bart confirmed or confirmed in other ways, uh, you know, it's uh, a matter of time. It's a matter of when rather than if. What uh, services or what um, knowledge or products can people get by going on your website, Arcadia Economics? Obviously, uh, a big part of it are your videos. Another big part of it is the book, The Big Silver Short, which is available now uh, in bookstores and online, I assume. Yep, yep. Uh, what else can you offer people by they're going to your site? Well, at the site, you can find information about silver, basically whatever you're looking for there. Uh, although perhaps more importantly than that, I like to offer perhaps some perspective that I know it's often phrased as, you know, we're gonna be shooting each other in the streets and the world's gonna end. I used to believe that I actually left the US at one point because I believed it that strongly. Although now I think about more and more the way the dollar is used and the different schemes. And I mean, handsome Bob, if we were using like tulip bulbs and pet rocks at this point, it probably life would be easier for most people where we have these, this paper dollar that, you know, 99% has been inflated since the fed comes along and they're just getting started. Um, yet if you ironically, understand. ironically, the shooting started when you came back. How do you mean? Well, you said you expected there to be violence in the streets. And so you left for a while and I'm saying now you came back and now it's actually happening. What you feared. Now I would uh, change that. I mean, perhaps now I'm seeing that, I guess it really comes down to our mindset. I've been in that fear mindset, but to me, it's exciting where, all right, if you have money to invest and you buy gold and silver, I think there's a chance that you're going to do really well. But, or even if you're just, it doesn't have to be gold and silver, whatever walk of life you're in, seeing the way the world is going, there's what we want and there's, you know, all right, right now there's a lot of things are closed down. So if you have a business online or have skills that you can translate online, to me, that's what nature or an economy does. It reallocates things and we get directed and it's sometimes we go kicking and screaming. But to answer your question, what I like to offer on the site is that there are incredible, it's almost incredible that we're still able to survive with all, they're eating 99% of the pie, but we're still able to do all these great things that human entrepreneurial spirit can do. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity and that's why I appreciate what you do, Bob, and, and showing people the different things that are going on out there. Um, I have a YouTube show where we cover this nightly. Uh, I do have a book called The Big Silver Short. If you have questions about metals, I also refer people to Miles Franklin, uh, Precious Metals Dealership. So if you're trying to buy or sell or store metals, you can contact and, and Miles Franklin, uh, as well as well as having a very good newsletter, which educates uh, their customers. And besides the fact that obviously they sell precious metals, um, you also represent them in in uh, the sale of the metals, and they also offer storage facilities and depositories that at a low cost can safeguard the metals and actually trust that the metals you're buying will remain in your ownership. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I partnered with Miles. I mean, I know some people might be thinking, well, is he just saying all this stuff because he sells metals? Uh, I, was, I left Wall Street because of this long before I was doing with Miles Franklin. In fact, Bob, you've known, uh, I guess it's uh, almost two years we've known each other now. And you've known it's not been like the easiest financial, I mean, I would have made a lot more money staying on Wall Street, yet it was something that was fascinating and partly why I've stuck and continue to do Arcadia. I remember walking through Occupy Wall Street, seeing you know, the, the one guy with the Ron Paul t-shirt and another guy holding a sign saying a job is a right. 
I get why people are confused and angry. And for the same reasons, they got clobbered by a mortgage bubble that no very few warned about. Some did like Peter. Um, I saw something similar happening and the show is free. Uh, I, I get to every email that comes in eventually, uh, at least attempt to, maybe I missed one here or there, but I felt it was important information that whether you're investing or whatever, you still uh, have a place where, and especially if you're interested in silver is our uh, strong suit. Um, but I mean, I wanted people to be able to get that information and uh, that's what Also silver uh, is referred to as the poor man's gold and the average young person out there maybe living in his parents basement these days isn't in a position normally to buy gold uh, for uh, 1900 or $2,000 an ounce, uh, but he can buy silver. I remember I had a friend who unfortunately was an alcoholic and he would go to the bar. And in those days, silver was about four bucks an ounce. It was 15, 20 years ago. And I would tell him, for God's sakes, instead of having three or four drinks a night, buy three or four ounces of silver a night and do it on a regular, steady basis. Unfortunately, he never took that advice and the alcohol eventually uh, led to his death. But uh, certainly for young people who don't have the money, would you recommend that they try to accumulate silver when it's still relatively cheap? I mean, I think investing in silver can be great if you have the right mindset and understand what you're doing. If you just, li you know, if someone listened to this, you know, hour or whatever we've been talking and they're just, their eyes are glazing over, then there's probably something better to invest in. And I think that, uh, was it Peter Lynch, like invest in what you know and is always a good thing. I mean, if you don't have a lot of cash right now, then by all means, I would not go on margin or leverage to get into silver. If there's ever been a, a, a terrible idea in investing or a terrible place to, to borrow money, because that, that's just how silver has been for so long. So I wouldn't recommend that. But I mean, if someone doesn't have a lot of investing money, you still, I think there, I like to think there was a lot of important information that we talked about here today that you can't easily find in Wall Street Journal or CNBC. And if, you know, just explaining this in fact, uh, Hansel Bob, I know, you know, Rick rule. And, uh, I did an interview with him last year where it was less about the numbers and more about, you know, what, what are the skills that have made you successful? And he mentioned that the surest way to make a fortune, is to find a way to make rich people richer. So, and that doesn't have to be like the bad, uh, you know, uh, Montgomery Burns, rich, bad guy stereotype, but find people, and that's what I've done where I had this knowledge of silver and finding, it changed uh, me as a person because it forces you to find like, what is really of value to people? How can I reach them? So whatever area of life that is, uh, I think things are changing. I don't think that means they're ending and for, you know, the more we're able to be flexible and, and go with that, I think that will be the most valuable skill going forward. And um, hopefully this was a helpful talk on that path. Do you have any uh, prognostication in terms of where this thing is heading? Gold, silver, the economy, the markets, what is the uh, direction you see us taking? I would be guessing on the timing, but I mean, in terms of the ultimate outcome, I don't see, I, if there's a way that gold and silver aren't ex, uh, exponentially higher, I would say sooner than later. But um, I mean, once you have the paper manipulation overwhelm, which appears to be happening now, you know, the metals are gonna be pretty, a lot higher. Um, Stock market on one hand will get crushed, but it may never happen in nominal terms, which means you might not see the number come down because they're printing so much money. But 
you know, if it's like if your portfolio doubles, but it costs you $200 for a slice of pizza, you didn't come out, you can't live or buy as much stuff. Um, so to me, real estate, I mean, you know, you have, you basically have insane amounts of money printed that have flowed into every market, except ironically, the ones that seemingly should have gone up the most. So again, you know, I'm, I'm a former trader, not a financial planner. Diver diversification is not my topic of expertise. Um, but to the degree that I think silver and gold are about as sure. I mean, unless you figure out, I mean, Bob, do you think they're ever going to repay the debt or unprint money? Not even a slight chance. Then maybe you'll have to wait a while for gold and silver, but it's happening now. And uh, you know, the world, the World Economic Forum is having their usual Davos conclave, and they're calling it the Great Reset, 2021, which is pretty interesting because that, to many people, refers to resetting the dollar, like yep. they did in Bretton Woods in 1944, but it certainly implies a complete changing of the system. I don't know whether that's going to entail getting rid of the dollar altogether or making the dollar uh, part of a basket of currencies mixed in with gold or silver. We're not sure which way the powers that be want to want to go, but whichever way they want to go will not inure to our benefit. So no one is going to protect us except us and people better wake up and take personal responsibility and go on sites like yours and educate themselves or read your book. You know, books, the things with a cover on either side that has paper in the middle and printing in the middle, book, yeah. Uh, very few people do that, unfortunately. They're too busy uh, watching uh, WWE wrestling. But at any rate, um, I'm gonna let you go. Uh, Thank you so much for your valuable time and all your knowledge. You've uh, gone through a journey that some of us go through in order to get that knowledge. But the main thing is you actually care enough to want to get the knowledge. And that, that is a sign of character, something that's also lacking, unfortunately, in our modern culture, if you want to call it a culture. So we need to uh, reinvigorate that thirst for knowledge in people. It's still there when a baby comes out of the womb and you watch as the baby begins to develop the ability to see, the baby's eyes are dotting all around the room. It's doom, doom, doom all over. And the baby is taking in every input that it possibly can. And something happens, you send them to these government detention centers that are called schools and then you send them to college and waste all your money. And ultimately they lose what that baby had. And there are some of us like you who are still a baby in a lot of ways because you're looking around and trying to gather knowledge. I don't particularly like um, uh, the author of uh, uh, Pygmalion. Um, but he had this great quote. He said, uh, those with accurate powers of observation are called cynics by those who are deaf, dumb, and blind. And uh, I think that's very true. And so um, we need to get back that curiosity, get back that thirst for knowledge. And that thirst for knowledge will give you a Kevlar protection vest in a world that's going to be very dangerous and we need to make sure that we act and not just you know in the bible it says that when moses put his staff out over the red sea it didn't open up until a guy named noxion dove right into the water and then it opened up so we have to have faith but also action, we have to take action. So anyway, I thank you for taking the action of speaking to me this afternoon. God bless you and yours, and I'm sure we'll be talking soon. 
Take care. Right. Appreciate that, Bob. Thank you.